Welcome to Make a Path Presents. I'm Ronnie Hayes, and today let's talk about Game of Thrones Season 7, Episode 6. Now, I'm actually really glad that I'm getting a chance to do to do this review a little bit late because it gave me an opportunity to watch the episode again twice. And I have to tell you, it's because I was shocked by how many comments were saying this was a bad episode. Now, if you're a, a book fan and it's um, you know kind of going off course, and okay, that's a little bit different from the comments that I'm talking about where fans just straight up didn't like the, the pacing and how things felt stretched out and unrealistic. The ex machinas where hero characters are being saved, red shirts are dying, it's too predictable, and Game of Thrones kind of lost its balls, Tormund should have died, like things like that. And uh, I was really shocked. I didn't think this was one of the worst episodes in the whole series. I know somewhere along the lines, there's episodes, especially with Arya and uh, some of those episodes in the past, there was some where it just completely lost me as far as my enjoyment levels. And I still really enjoyed this. So I really wanted to, to give this some extra time and watch it again and um, get my own new take on it. Are you guys right? Is this a complete shit episode? And was I just, you know, too into it not to notice? And I kind of have to disagree. I feel the same. I The same as I did when I first saw it. There's so much I did enjoy. But there's definitely problems. I could recognize the problems. Some of it... I'm going to honestly say I don't care about anymore. One big problem, let's get it, this out of the way right now, and this is a problem with pretty much any show when they have to deal with uh, timelines that don't add up. Like when, you're, when you need to move the story along and it's a little bit of a faster pace and you have things going on, it's easier here because it's left ambiguous enough with the guys uh, staying overnight on the ice and having Benjen run to the wall. Yeah, that's a stretch. I'll tell you that right now. That is a stretch. I feel like there could have been a different way to polish that up by having the guys get away a little bit, but be surrounded where the Whites know they're here somewhere, but they're hunting them down. You could have added... And yeah, yeah, I don't know, it was a pretty tight episode, but if you needed, if you really needed to, you could have added something where they got away, but they're still surrounded, and uh, the Whites and the White Walkers are have these little parties going out looking for them. Then you got them at nighttime, very difficult to see. They're trying to stay quiet. They're trying to listen for things coming for them. Maybe you have some Whites doing patrols, and it's just tension-filled. They could have done that. And then when the morning comes, then they do the runaway and they get stuck on the lake. Then they're there for more hours, you know. And maybe even do a whole nother day where they stay over another night and we see them pull like, you got to feed them, like beef jerky type food. They got to have that type of food if they're doing all that traveling, even in the Game of Thrones, you know what I mean? <laughs> they pull something out that they're eating, something salted and preserved. And then uh, even with lighting a fire since they're, you know, uh, trapped on that little part of the island there. You see what I'm saying? Just add a little bit. Uh, so I, I feel like there was something they could have done. But at the end of the day, it would have cost more money. They would have had to film a little bit more time. It would have been a longer episode. So it's probably easier for them to say, oh, well, our fans are just going to have to deal with it and suspend their disbelief. So... That's. I just want to clarify that. I did enjoy this episode, and for the problem with the timeline, I agree with you. It's problematic, but it, do, it just doesn't hurt my enjoyment of the episode. Now, let's dive into this with the back and forth, and I'm going to skip a few things. I think, you know, if it's just blatantly obvious or uh, it just wasn't that impactful uh, for me or I might have just forgot about it. You guys can comment down in the comment box, but I want to touch on the things that stuck out for me the most. The back and forth with Hound and Tormund, I love it. I loved a lot of the uh, conversations between the characters, our heroes, as they were walking. I liked it. Like John and Jorah, for example. Would it have made more sense for him to offer him his sword back you know, previously? Probably, yeah. What, were they traveling and then they were on a boat? Or they were on a boat and then did some traveling or however it went down. Sure, yeah, but I get it. You know, it's for simplicity's sake as far as their, their filming schedule. I'm fine with him offering it to him now. Uh, we could even say, you know, John was kind of working up the courage or, you know, working up to it a little bit. You know, I'm fine with that. Now, going back to Hound and Tormund real quick, I love the Brienne shit. 
I absolutely love that part where he's like, oh, I got this, you know, beast, wonderful giant of a woman waiting back for me. And he's like, Brianna fucking Tarth. You're with Brianna fucking Tarth. And he's like, I, uh, I, I can tell by how she looks at me. And he's like, does she look at you like she wants to chop you up and eat your liver or something like that? And he's like, you do know her. <laughs> I love that shit. Uh, there was, yeah, a lot of the, the characters talking as a whole, I didn't find any problems with it. We got Sansa and Arya. I got a problem with this. I got a real big problem with this. First, is there a little contradiction with season one with her shooting the arrows? You guys let me know because I've been talking about wanting to rewatch the previous seasons because I only watched all of it once. There was a couple episodes in like season five or, or such where I watched like the episodes twice. But since season one, a few years ago, I only watched it once and I've been dying to revisit it. And I feel like I'm going to know a lot more once I revisit it and I'm going to enjoy season one a hell of a lot more now knowing more about the lore and the characters and the families and the history and the background. So I'm really excited. But I had it on the TV while I was working, and they had the Arya hitting the bullseye. But then in this, she was talking about how she, you know, Bran was training, but they didn't hit the bullseye. I don't know if that was a contradiction or maybe they missed something or it was just something different. But that doesn't matter. Let's jump into the Sansa and um, how Arya was talking all this shit about um, given her life for, or you were you tortured? Did they pop your bones out, put a knife to your throat? Talking all this shit, and there's no mention or no. I don't. It just feels like a contradiction because, you know, Arya was right there with Tywin. I mean, she was right there. I mean, didn't she even try to cut him? Wasn't she like hiding the knife at one point in time? And she didn't give her life up to kill him right then and there. And I know, I think Jamie's the one who really set up the Red Wedding or played a big part in setting up the Red Wedding, didn't he? Because he passed that message along. Um, you know what I mean? So, but Tywin is the, he's the head of the house, right? So wouldn't you think you're talking all this shit to Sansa? What about when you were the waitress and you're hiding out and you're chilling and having these nice conversations with him? Just fuck. It felt like it was hypocritical and it really bothered me. And then with Sansa, I kind of feel like there's something different going on here. And maybe they're trying to pull one over on us and, you know, the girls are working together, which it seems like Sansa is left in the dark. Like if they're working together, someone tell Sansa because she has no clue what the fuck is going on, you know? But I, I feel like this could have been remedied if Sansa just flat out said, you know what? Yeah, I was terrified. It, it was, you know, horrible. And just opened up and told her the truth. She she could just tell her about all the shit she had to deal with and survive. I, and I just feel like if she would have just said that and been open and honest and just, you know, as embarrassing or maybe she would have felt bad about, you know, being weak in the moment. She was weak in certain moments. She didn't say, no, you're just going to have to kill me. You know, she didn't do that. Just be open about it and talk about the uh, abuse and the trickery and how people acted and how it's a different environment. They make you feel like you're doing the right thing and helping your family and you got so many people egging you on and, and then there's the hidden threats and then there's the threats that are not hidden at all. I don't know, just came out with it. So anyway, mo we move on to Danny and Tyrion. I like their back and forth. I think the size of Jon's, um, well, it was the size of John, but then she was like, that's not the size I was talking about. I, I don't know. I felt like that joke was a little beneath the writing. <laughs> uh, it's good for a chuckle, but I don't know. There's something off there. And the talk about a successor was also something that I didn't care for. Why are we talking about this now? This isn't something that Tyrion, I mean, he's clever as shit. This isn't something he was worried about before. Or is it only that, you know, they're so close to it now, he's finally like, Oh shit! You know, I totally, I totally didn't even think who would take over and rule if she dies. You know, five days into her, uh, you know, <laughs> into ruling. Anyway, five days into her sitting on the Iron Throne. Anyway, so we got Sansa and Peter, little finger fucker, and this is another scene that confused me and annoyed me a little bit because Peter Baelish is a slimy little prick who's who's kind of he put this. You know, he put this in motion by setting Sansa up and letting Arya get that, that scroll. So, he tells Sansa, Brianna Tarth is here and she would help out and get involved. If Arya wanted to hurt you, Brienne would never let that happen. So, go to Brienne. 
But then later we see Sansa sending Brienne away. So I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, Sansa, are you really trying to kill Arya now? You know, and if you, are you, and I know this is a stretch because I don't hear any fans talking about this. I hear fans talking about how uh, Arya gave Sansa the dagger to show like they were cool. It's like a hidden code, even though Sansa looked like she shit herself still. So I don't understand how she knew that it was a hidden code. And then even after that, she goes to Peter Baelish. Maybe she's stringing him along too. But then she sends, you know, Brienne away, which is confusing. And a lot of people are saying that's supposed to be code that, you know, you can trust, uh, Arya can trust uh, her now because she gave her the dagger. And then Sansa is sending her protector away. So now Arya's free to kill Sansa. So it's showing that they... That is confusing if they not confusing, but I just feel like that's convoluted as fuck, you know? And then another thing that's convoluted as all hell is if Littlefinger said, hey, Sansa, Bran will protect you if you go and talk to her about this. She'll keep you safe from Arya. If he said that, knowing she would send her away to try to hurt Arya, I'm sorry, but I draw a fucking line. There's no way you're that clever and you can guess what the other person... I, I don't believe... That's going to work. And I know Littlefinger is sneaky, but I don't believe that little bit of nudge. You know what I'm saying? Like, there should have been another little drop in there. Like, you know, if Arya was a real threat and you needed you needed her to be taken care of, you might have to move Brienne out of the way. But I don't think it should come to that. I don't believe it at all. I know you're a little worried and scared, but trust me, bring Brienne in here. Talk to her. Tell her to talk to Arya or stay by your side and whoop de whoop like like if there was a little bit of nugget maybe I would believe it that little finger fucker would go ahead and and do some shit like that I don't know it's just getting really frustrating between Arya and Sansa on both sides Arya the way she's coming off as if she was a bad like you're a badass now sure fine you know what I'm saying but let's not forget you weren't always a badass so cut your sister some slack you know what I mean and when it comes to Sansa, her sending Brienne away and her, you know, not just opening up, I don't know. It's just frustrating. And again, how she talked to the lords and stuff when they were talking about already about turning their backs on John, it just frustrates the hell out of me. And I'm, I don't know, ugh, I'm just ugh, with those two. And I don't want it to come to where the, the, the family members are. After, you know, I want the Stark family to unite, not – like that kind of conflict is not interesting to me. And that's a problem with Hollywood. Conflict is king. Conflict is king. And a lot of times they neglect reward, but I think the um, Game of Thrones really gives you the reward when the time is necessary, you know? They abuse the shit out of Sansa over and over and over and over again. Then they give you a little bit of, of a reward for uh, her winning something, you know? She wins, you know, her freedom. She escapes, and then she wins by bringing the veil, the veil Army here and winning the Battle of the Bastards. I don't know, just uh, that frustrated me too, where she said, uh, you didn't win it, John didn't win it, I want it, and I'm thinking, bitch, were you, the, were you fighting too? <laughs> yeah. Okay, they came to fight for you, but let's not hype it up too much now. Let's let's get real. At least John was getting his hands dirty. I mean, damn, bitch. <laughs> anyway, th those two were just frustrating me a little bit. Let's go to John and the White Walker. This shit I don't like. I don't like this, where he killed the White Walker and those whites fell down. Conveniently, it left one alive. <laughs> But this is the shit we see in, what, didn't Independence Day do this? Tons of other movies do this. This is uh, a TV trope or movie trope, and it's a bad one, and I hate it because once you set this up, oh, you have these four or five, you know, let's call them the, the heads, you know, the masters, the lords, the, the white walkers, you have those five powerful ones and you have all the little clones spawn the pawns or whatever you want to call them the shit that they are massive and they're they're your whole army and it looks like there's no way you can defeat them but in reality once you get backed into a wall like the heroes are losing they're losing bad there's no way they're gonna win and then you kill off you know the head king and everyone just dies i can't stand that if they pulse i hope this is misleading 
I will give them negative points out the ass if that is in any battles or any final battles where they are overpowered like crazy and John kills, you know, the White King or the King or even the other White Walkers and, you know, half of their army falls apart. I hate that. I think that is such a cheap and lazy way to write your villains. At least make them the where uh, if you kill the uh, White Walkers, the whites, you know, they're still whites, but they're not as structured. They're not as dangerous now. They're kind of all over the place. I don't know. Do something like that, you know. They're not as organized. I just, that bothers me so damn much. Let's go down to the uh, being surrounded by being surrounded by ice. I've seen a lot of fans wondering what was going on there, and I thought maybe what I was seeing wasn't really what I was seeing. Once they found that convenient island and all the whites were falling through the water, as I was watching it, I just got the feeling that they waited until the ice froze over. And then uh, you got to show them, okay, the ice is frozen now. Let's start walking forward. So why not put a funny scene? That's all I thought it was. I don't think they forgot about attacking them and then, you know, um, uh, the hound threw a rock and then they, oh, shit, oh, shit, you know, we can attack now. I didn't think that at all. I thought they were just waiting. And they're going to attack any minute now. They're just waiting, making sure that ice is frozen over. And then he throws the rock, and it goes, clump, takes his jaw off, throws a second rock, and it, it's a heavier rock. And it lands and shows that it's frozen over a good amount. So the one white was just like, yep, let's see if it'll hold my body weight. And then if you notice, it wasn't all of them all at once. It was enough scattered so that way it would hold some of the weight. That's how I thought of it. So um, a lot of those comments saying they, they forgot, and I saw that a lot. Like they just stopped and forgot to attack. You know, I thought they it was uh, purposeful to wait. You know, what else? No, They're not going to run away. I mean, they got them surrounded. So they were just waiting for it to freeze over. Anyway, we have uh, Thoros dying. I thought this was a little bit of a problem. Thoros dies, and I thought it was cool that the Hound finally took the drink that Thoros offered him before. I f he said something about something. He made fun of him. What was it like drinking after him? Some shit like that. But he turned him down originally, but now he's drinking after him. And then we get um, uh, the, um, the beautiful ginger bastard. We get Thorman who says, uh, oh, sarcastically, maybe the Lord of Light will give us some fire or else we're all going to die. And I'm thinking like, wait a minute, you saw them light their swords twice, you know, twice now. They lit them for the the bear, the zombie bear, which was really cool. I think that was a really cool thing. But the bear, the way it looked, its shape was kind of odd and it kind of took away. And I, maybe it's shaped a little different than a normal bear or maybe that was just me. But I, I thought it took away from the CGI but I think it was supposed to have that type of shape. I don't know. Anyway, he saw them light the swords. So why was he making that comment like, you know, not believing they would get... F I don't know. I thought that part was weird. But we have the Tormund, the near-death scene. And I want to talk about this real quick because a lot of fans are saying, oh, you know, and they say this with The Walking Dead too. That's another show where if you don't kill a main character during a moment where a main character gets close to dying... Uh, all of a sudden, sudden you lost your balls, you know, and you're not real. And I disagree with it in The Walking Dead, and I disagree with it in Game of Thrones. I think there's going to be a perfect time to kill Thorman uh, if you're going to kill him. You know what I mean? Um, Tor, I don't know why I called him that. I was going to say Thoros, and, <laughs> and anyway, if the time comes for you to kill him, then kill him off. But if it's not the moment now. Create a scene that is full of tension and you're relieved when when you don't kill him. Real quick, in The Walking Dead, there was a moment where a character named Glenn got backed up to a wall after they um, made their way into the community. And zombies were everywhere and he was getting close to a wall. And this wasn't a moment that was in the comic book, so it was kind of like fresh for TV. And I was actually starting to sweat because I was like, they faked his death like the, the week or two before. And then now it was like, wait a minute, are they really going to, are they really, and it was just badass. I mean... There was a, a point where, all right, they're not going to kill him. But it was just like the, the torment scene here where you get that tension, the edge of your seat tension where they might take him out like this. But just because they doesn't, they don't. <laughs> they doesn't, yo. Just because they didn't, 
doesn't mean they lost the balls, at least not in my opinion. We have um, the dragon rescue. Uh, I thought it was cool because she could see it firsthand. You know, she sees this shit and this is epic. And then she makes a new enemy. I mean, a new nemesis because she has the, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. That has to do with the dragon. But we see the, the White Walker walking over fire. And I thought that was badass because the whites all burn up. But when he walked over the fire, and that was the fire from the dragon, the fire, like, backed the fuck away. <laughs> you know, that shit was badass. So he throws the spear, and he takes out the dragon that is in the air. And I had to rewatch it a couple times because I didn't think they would have the dragon so close. I thought I was seeing things the first time, but a lot the first viewing. But a lot of fans were like, why didn't he hit all the heroes on the, the dragon that was on the ground? And the only thing I could come up with logically is he has a set army you know and he's building his army of whites the dragon in the air was doing massive damage it, he was burning motherfuckers up still right right then and there and the other dragon was on the ground and he was not shooting fire at anyone uh now it didn't seem like it i could go back and double check or whatever for a moment it looks like it is but i think that's the fire that's already burning so if you if it was just like a mathematical equation this guy's just demolishing your crew, your army. Take him out, and you have another chance to get the one on the ground. But think about it in reverse. If you take the one out on the ground, even if you kill the dragon, you're not going to kill the riders on the dragon. They can hop on another dragon. But now you leave the dragon that's killing all your, your army. you got to get another spear and throw it at the one in the air. That one might be ready now, and he might come after you now. So I just figure, like, mathematically, that was, like, a better choice to make. When I, you know, first watched it, that's all I thought of it. But uh, when you rewatch it, people are right. That other dragon, uh, he looks a lot closer than, and it would have been, like, a lot easier. But I'm sticking with that. It was a simple, uh, okay, this guy's burning up my army. I'm going to hit him with a spear and call it a day. And th another thing fans are talking about is the green dream, something in the book where he can see the uh, future. I have a problem with this partially. If he can see the future, why did he throw the second arrow? The spear, I'm sorry. Why did he throw that? If he can see the future and he, and he knows he misses, why bother throwing it, you know? Unless you can't see the future clearly maybe he can see some of the future like oh you know eventually if we keep him on this island you know the dragons will come you know and then you have a chance at getting them maybe he even sees a victory where he takes a dragon down but it's it's kind of cloudy after that like it's not exact so you guys let me know uh give me the thoughts and opinions and theories stuff from the book or whatever is this green dream real is that the shit i keep Something something like that I keep seeing in the comments, but is that true? Can he see the future exactly? I kind of feel like that's really poor writing if you can see like the actual future because if you lose and then you, you know, you change your course of action and then, I don't know, it's just, if he can see the future in some type of cloudy way, I feel like that suits the story a little better. All right, so next up we have the chains. Uh, not next up, but I skipped John going into the water, but I'll get back to that. So we have the chains, and I believe that was from the a boat that was docked nearby. Because when you see them pulling a the dragon out, there's actually a dock. Look to the left. You can see that uh, there's a dock clear as day. And a lot of uh, book fans are saying that that was next to Hearth Home. And that was another area where they had boats and chains. And someone said, I couldn't find it, but someone said there's actually a scene where you see chains before in a previous scene. I looked twice and I somehow missed it. Uh, it's, it's probably like right there, but I don't know. I missed it. Uh, so I don't think they made these. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't care about the chains. There was chains laying around somewhere. This used to be a, a shipping village or something like that. So they got chains from the wreckage. I'm fine with that. They don't need to show it, you know. 
I'm fine with that. Now, one thing that's problematic is how they got the chains on the dragon. And I still I still get annoyed because this is an easy fix. If you're in the writer's room and you're like, oh, how do they get the chains on, on the dragon? Because a lot of people say the whites can't swim. And I mean, you could sacrifice some whites, right? They live forever. You, you send them down there with chains. They go all the way down. They rope up the dragon and they just hang on and everyone pulls them up with the dragon. No? Is that not how it works? <laughs> um, but here's an easy fix. As the dragon sinks, you realize that the water is only deep enough for the dragon to go underwater. So you can still kind of see the, the dragon's skin like under a foot of water. So that way the, you know, the, the water's only give like what? Uh, it's 15 feet, you know? Say it's 15 feet deep or something, or even less, you know, it's 8 feet deep. You see what I'm saying, though, where they can still walk over to the water, put the chains, you get what I'm saying? Anyhow, let's go to, so that stuff doesn't bother me. Let's go to the the, the scene where John and the, the heroes are jumping on the dragon. I feel like this is a good scene but needed a little bit different when they were filming it. It looks like they recorded later and they added John saying, go, get on the dragon, or he just says go, but he tells everyone else to get on the dragon and he fights the whites so they can't harm the dragon or they can't come up to the dragon or anyone getting on the dragon to help. So he starts you know, taking them out. And I do feel like it was problematic that he kind of felt like a show off a little bit going too far away. Uh, I don't know. There was something there with the direction. I really felt like they should have had John clearly turn around and be like, you know, get on the dragon. I'll hold them off or do something. Cause it did feel like he kind of like, I'm going to get on the dragon, you know, take my hand. And then he thought, Oh, wait a minute. I got to show off a little bit. <laughs> you know, Danny's here. Cha Ching. I'm a hero. I don't know. There was a little bit there. And then when he goes into the water, this is something I have a problem with. Benjamin just showing up out of the blue. I really would have preferred in the beginning of the episode, they show Benjamin. And if you want to leave it ambiguous as to how he knows when everyone's in trouble, he saves, you know, Bran, what, a season ago or something like that. Now he saves Jon Snow. If instead of him just showing up in the very beginning of this episode, have Benjamin, you know, get freaked, hop on his horse and take off. And then later when he links up, we know, oh my God, he got some type of knowledge or I don't know. He knew somehow and then he rode into it. Maybe that, you know, interferes with the story or his powers, so to speak. Uh, but I thought it needed something. And at this point in time, Benjamin's sacrifice, a lot of fans are like, uh, what is the sacrifice for and yada, yada, yada. And this might piss off some that don't like that scene and his death. But his sacrifice is only, it is only so Danny can see the scars on John. L replay it and see this. He's going to leave. He gets knocked into the water. He gets out of the water. And I love how he uses his, um, I love how he uses long claw to dig into the ice and then pull himself up. I love that. Uh, really realistic because him pulling himself up just, I don't know, that's going to be rough, but he uses his sword and, you know, he looks frozen. He looks like, I, at this point in time, I'm like, how are they going to get him out of this? And then Benjamin shows up. But my thing is with, uh, with him freezing now and then coming to the gate, the wall later on, and then he's on the boat and then, uh, he's healing up and they take his clothes off. They only did that to show his scars. That is it. Think about it now. There's no other reason for that scene to happen. Benjamin dies only to show John's scars to Danny. And I like the idea that they left him. I like how he turned around and he's like, go, go, just leave, go. And he gets tackled into the water. I really like that stuff. I just kind of felt like, I don't know, there's something problematic there. Like he could have got out of the water and maybe tried to not get seen. <laughs> I mean, if Benjamin Benjamin didn't show up, he was fucked. I mean, he was fucked. So that was something that uh, I had a little bit of problems with. <laughs> but still, I like it. I do like it. I, I like the fact that it, he does that, makes that sacrifice. But there's some problems there. And I feel like maybe they needed a little bit of polish on it. And they could have gotten it a little bit better. Now, at the end, what else is there to say? You know, they got a dragon now. And I guess the dragon will breathe. Um, 
ice. <laughs> I know some fans say there's actually ice dragons that are actually blue or transparent in the, the book, which there's ice dragons which are different than the dragon that gets turned, <laughs> you know, by the king. So I don't know what they're called, but the dragon now, I'm assuming he's going to shoot ice. I mean, he wouldn't shoot fire, right? That would be kind of, would that be like a contradiction? But either way, if he shoots ice or fire, that I guess most likely is the most predictable guess is for how they get past the wall. This is where I'm really excited because the meetup is really, it sounds really stupid for all the people to meet up. But then in the same time, you have the this army of the dead so close. I mean, they are there. I mean, they are so damn close to the wall. And you need to make a move now. And Danny and uh, John, them uniting uh, the North and that whole army, it might not be enough to take them out. I mean, they could probably do it, but they might need backup. Or maybe they can do that, but they can't do that and take out Cersei after. There's just no way that's going to work. Or at least in my opinion, I would be nervous. I mean, I would be really nervous taking out the army of the undead and then taking on Cersei afterwards. I don't know. That's just, I mean, damn. What if you take on the undead and then you turn around, lose a lot of your army? I mean, what if you take a beating? You win, but you take a beating. Then what do you do? I mean, what do you do from from there? Cersei's going to come after you and kill all of you. You know what I'm saying? Cersei's not just going to go, okay, you know, she left me alone. She's going to go, you know, send out some people and figure out where they're at, figure out what moves they're making, and then she's going to send an army out to kill you. So uh, even though it might seem like a stupid thing, I am eager to get dialogue between all these characters that are enemies. Even if this means we're going to get some face-to-face -face with these characters that are enemies and they're going to kill each other down the line, I love that we're getting this face-to-face -face and then they're going to take on this... Um, because, listen, this is a cool dynamic that I would like to see. You're going to have a little bit of time in between, hopefully, in between them meeting face-to-face -face and the war with the undead. I really hope the undead don't die in the season finale. I hope we get a start to the war. But how cool would it be if Jamie leaves, leads an army and you have these characters who are later supposed to fight and fight each other and kill each other. You have Brianna Tarth, Jamie, Jon Snow, uh, Danny, and her dragons. You have all these characters that are fighting together. You know what I mean? Yeah, Cersei could be the main bad guy, but I just love that idea. Some of them could even grow a little bond on the battlefield, and they have to turn around later in the next season, you know, a couple episodes into the season, and go to war with each other. There's something there, that creative playground that I talk about. I love the possibilities there. I think the potential is just gold, and I love it. So I'm cool with the meaning because think about the alternatives. Them attacking the Night King, you know what I'm saying? And then what happens after that? You know, for the longest, I was calling him Ice King, I think, in this video, this very video. I might have screwed that up. But them attacking the Night King and then um, going after Cersei, I don't know. I think they are stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know? Listen, and I've seen people say, let the uh, let the undead come and attack Cersei and them, and then attack when they're down. And I'm thinking, well, they absorb their enemy. Imagine that. Imagine them taking over Cersei and the Lannisters and their armies and adding them to the ranks of the undead. I just, that that's just flawed I feel so you give me your thoughts and opinions what do you think about the um yeah what do you think about the season finale coming up as far as the Lannisters the Starks uh the Danny and the Unsullied and the um Dothraki everybody Tyrion everybody as a whole coming together and then eventually having to fight each other and what about the Night King and the army of the undead do you think they're going to die in the season finale or live to be in the beginning of the new season coming next year. I want to see them in the new season. I hope we do get a bang of an episode, but I want to see the main war in the next season. That would be cool to get 
the main war between both the living, you know, and the dead. That would be awesome. Anyway, I talked for far too long. Sorry this video is as long as it is. Give me all your thoughts and opinions down in that comment box. I'm done talking. It's your turn.